Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon everyone. So my name is Fadli. Uh, I'm from University of Malaya. So uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for giving me this opportunity to share my experience on what is known as knowledge translation. And it's actually sort of like continuation from the uh, Rauda's presentation actually. So the title of my presentation is Knowledge Translation Connecting Knowledge Creators to the World. So this will be the outline of my presentation. So I will talk about what is knowledge translation in general. All right, and from there, I will explain what are the ingredients or elements that we need for knowledge translation to occur in our research studies and illustrate that with a few case studies. So bear in mind that the case studies will not focus on the technical aspect of it, the results and whatnot, but rather bringing you to the journey of how these studies are being transformed into action. And I will give some take home messages at the end of the presentation. So what is uh, KT? So KT generally is the process of turning knowledge into action. All right, it has two major components, knowledge creation as well as knowledge application. So KT is actually by definition is a dynamic process that includes the synthesis, the dissemination and application of knowledge to increase health, uh, improve health in general. So there are two major types of KT approach that we can, that we can use. First is what is known as integrated KT, which requires a collaborative approach. This is when the knowledge users, which are the stakeholders and the researchers, the uh, knowledge creators, work together from the beginning of the knowledge creation all the way to knowledge application. The other type of KT approach is what is known as end of grant KT, in which the knowledge creators, the researchers are heavily involved in creating the knowledge. Following that, they will then engage with the stakeholders for the knowledge application using some KT strategies. So what this presentation will focus more is on the integrated KT, in which, like I've mentioned before, is when the knowledge users and researchers work together all the way from the beginning, shaping the research questions, coming up with the methodology, data collection, analysis, all the way to the dissemination and application. So that, in a nutshell, is what KT is all about. It's, it's a whole process of us making sure that the knowledge created are being translated, being transformed into utilization and application. So the next question is, what are the elements that we need, the ingredients that we need for KT to happen? And for this, uh, I would like to share with you two major frameworks in the KT world. Well, first is the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, known as CFIR. Second is the Knowledge to Action Cycle. So what is CFIR? So CFIR was introduced, was developed by Dan Schroeder in 2009. Basically, it says that there are five elements that ne you need to consider whenever you try to facilitate KT in your research projects. First one is the process. Process focuses more on the overall structure of your study. It needs to be designed, it needs to be tailored in such a way that will help to facilitate KT. Second is the intervention characteristics focusing more on your research products, your research findings. It needs to be relevant to the stakeholders. It needs to be attractive enough for it to be utilized. Third is the outer setting. You need to consider the context of where your project is being done, whether it is suitable, is it conducive for you to push forward the project. In a setting, focusing more on your research uh, team, research organization itself, in terms of the organization structure, the roles that your team members are playing, as well as the resources that you put to improve the communication within the team members to facilitate KT. And last but not least is, uh, is the individuals involved. In terms of the expertise that they have, in terms of motivation that your team has for pushing forward towards KT. So those five elements, I feel, are the main foundation that you need to have even before you start your any project or even during or after for you to facilitate KT. Following that, once you have that foundation, it can then be used for you to create knowledge and for you to use uh, for it to apply, I mean, to translate that into um, practice. So the second uh, framework is what is known as the KTA cycle or knowledge to action cycle, which uh, was developed by Graham in 2006, which depicts the whole process from knowledge creation of identifying problem, coming up with the intervention, tailor it to suit the local context, refine it if necessary, evaluate, as well as make taking strategies to sustain the knowledge use. So the, so the first case study will focus more on the application of the first framework, which is the CFIR. 
So for this uh, case study, it is my uh, project. And at this moment, it's still at the protocol phase. Uh, it is a validation study. Uh, it's about developing what is known as a parental digital security tool, assessing parents' uh, digital security practice on making sure that their children are safe online. So the thing is, at the moment, children always see parents as a source of guidance whenever they have negative internet experiences, your cyberbullying, internet safety, internet privacy. But studies have also shown that parents themselves are unsure on how to actually tackle the issue of all the cyber issues pertaining their children. So there is a gap that needs to be addressed here, and there is a, studies are very much needed to empower parents on cyber parenting. So by examining parental digital security practice is one of the way to, to, towards empowering the parents on cyber parenting. But for you to understand the needs, the knowledge that they have on digital security practice, you need to have a validated strong tool to actually measure this. And this is what the study is intended to do. The objective of the study is to produce a validated parental digital security assessment tool among Malaysian parents. The study will have two phases. The first phase is to produce an assessment tool on measuring parental digital security practice. Following that, once the study has been completed, it will then the assessment tool will then be integrated on a nationwide parent cyber parenting module. So just to show you, the first phase will include the item development, which includes a systematic review to look at what are the existing items available on literature. Using that, an inventory of items will then be created, it will be discussed with major stakeholders to get their input to refine those items. Content validation, translation will then be conducted, as well as pre-testing at this stage. Following that, data collection for validity and reliability will then be performed and will be analyzed for factor analysis and uh, reliability, inter-item reliability. Following that, the questionnaire will then be developed and will be integrated on a nationwide scale uh, for utilization later on. So coming back to the CFIR, so as you can see, there are five major elements, but as it is, each element has their own sub-elements that you need to consider. So I would like to demonstrate using the protocol that I've developed on how I actually consider all these elements as I develop the protocol itself to facilitate KT as I embark on the journey uh, in early next year. So first of all is the process. As I've mentioned, process is the overall structure of the study, all the way from planning, engaging, executing, and reflection and evaluation. Even though the, the project will only be conducted next year, but the groundwork has been done for the past one year. So what we did, we actually engaged, we identified our key, stakeho key stakeholders, the Ministry of Health. So Ministry of Health, especially on the Child and Adolescent Health Division, Cybersecurity Malaysia, which is the main agency that is responsible to maintain the cybersecurity aspect in whole Malaysia, as well as the majors, the main stakeholders, which are the parents themselves through NGOs and through surveys and online um, engagement as well. So what we did for the past one year, we actually engaged with them. We tried to gain input from them through documents. We had meetings with them. We actually come up with articles, put it online to see to gauge parents' uh, uh, responses to see what are their needs when it comes to cyber parenting and cyber security aspect. So from there, the, we, we, we synthesize the input and that's when we come up with, the, with addressing the gap of reducing, of, of uh, tackling the issue of uh, digital security practice. The next step is setting the direction of the study. Again, we engage with the stakeholders, we see we, 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 we discuss with them what's the best way to tackle their concerns and that's when we feel that coming out with a validated tool will be the first major step for us to understand the parents needs on cyber parenting. So once, so as you can see, the, the direction of the study was pretty much set between the stakeholders and the researchers from, uh, from our side. So once you have set the direction of the study, the next step is obviously to conduct the study itself. So the major thing, that the, the main important thing for you to facilitate for KT to happen is to make sure that they are very much engaged throughout the study. So for the, for, for the study itself, how do we ensure that they are engaged in our study? We make them to be part of our team members and that's when by having them as part of team members, it will help to, have, uh, to make them to have that sense of belonging of that project. At the same time, we also help to, pro to give feedback on a continuous manner. So they will be involved in the questionnaire development, the data collection analysis, and of course, following that, they will help to utilize the uh, production, the, the questionnaire develop and evaluation later on. So as you can see, the process itself is tailored, is designed in such a way to help facilitate KT before I embark on the journey. 
Second is the intervention characteristics. In this case, the questionnaire itself. As I've mentioned, it needs to be relevant to the stakeholders. It needs to be attractive enough to be used by the stakeholders. So in terms of how relevant it is to the stakeholders, this is very much assured because we actually engage with them early on. So we set the direction together with them. So this will help to ensure that in terms of relevance, it's very much relevant to the stakeholders. And it will be developed in a robust manner through the whole process of questionnaire development. And from there, in that sense, it will give a strong evidence strength for it, for it to be used later on. And since it will be utilized in a nationwide cyber parenting module, it will be self-administered. So we need to design the question in such a way that it will be easy to be used. So in terms of complexity, packaging, it needs to be easy enough for it to be adapted in a nationwide scale. So it will also be, conduct, uh, be uh, produced in dual language, Malay and English, to increase the uptake of those questionnaires in the population. So outer setting. So outer setting, we're talking about how conducive the condition is. To see how relevant the study is in the Malaysian context, we need to look at what is Malaysian's internet usage trend. So as it is, a nationwide survey has shown about 87% of total population in Malaysia are internet users, high percentage. And the nationwide survey conducted among school children aged 7 to 18 years old have shown that 97% of school children are internet users as well. <clears throat> so in terms of how aware the policymakers are in terms of the challenges that they face on online issues, so these are, re these are reflected by a few actions that they make. For instance, the latest bill that's been passed on on sexual offences against children bill, which criminalises sex grooming and child pornography in Malaysia with heavy, puni uh, heavy punishment, as well as the establishment of the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, which is the regulatory body that's responsible for resp uh, technology use in Malaysia. So, in the Ministry of Education, there is a strong move towards advancement of IT and technology use in the education system and it is explicitly mentioned in the National Education Blueprint of having broadband in schools. So, if there is increase of exposure, increase to usage of internet, the government, the policy makers are aware of the challenges and all this condition is definitely conducive enough for us to have studies that, 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 that address the needs of parents on cyber parenting. So this kind of study, for my study, will have the potential to be pushed further for KT in this kind of environment. In terms of inner setting, as I've mentioned, I am the principal investigator. So as it is, the roles are very much defined. The stakeholders are very well represented in my study to be as, uh, either as advisory role, as part of the data collect, uh, collectors, as well as part of uh, giving experts opinion on analysis and so forth. So, there are, so we have, uh, what we did, we have explicit um, uh, documentation as well as resources that has been put aside for mechanism for feedback among team members as well among the stakeholders. And last but not least, in terms of the CFIR, is the individuals involved. So in terms of the knowledge and beliefs, as I've mentioned, the stakeholders are well represented in the study. And that they, ask, they, are very, they are all experts in relevant fields on cyber, uh, on cyber parenting and cyber security, such as digital citizenship, adult education and cyber parenting from adolescent health, uh, cyber security, as well as the parents themselves. So they all share the same interest in tackling needs on cyber parenting, and all this will help to facilitate KT even further. So, so from the first case study, I hope I've illustrated to you how I actually consider all the elements in CFIR to be used as, my found, as a foundation for, it, for my study to be pushed further for KT to occur later on. So once you have that foundation, the next step is to use that foundation to, turn to, to create your knowledge and to turn into action. So this is when the knowledge to action cycle comes into place. As I've mentioned, it's been developed by Graham in 2006. It starts with the identifying the problem. From there, you develop the intervention and adapt those knowledge to local context, refine those intervention and monitor and evaluate, and you use strategies to actually sustain that knowledge use. So the second case study, such a study conducted by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Lau Lilan, in uh, Institute for Health System Research. It's a study on patients' unvoiced needs in which the patient's concerns are not conveyed fully to healthcare providers. Because of this, there's an issue of reduction of compliance on treatment, and the healthcare providers are, are, are aware of the issue of unvoiced needs, but they are unsure on how to actually tackle this issue. So the objective of this study was to identify the extent of unvoiced needs during consultation, especially in outpatient setting, to design an intervention measure to facilitate patients to voice their needs, and to assess the intervention outcome. 
So this study was conducted in two phases. The first phase was to explore the extent of unwashed needs. Second, using that input, they will then develop the intervention package and evaluation. So I will bring you the journey of the whole study using the KTA cycle. So it starts off with the identify problem. So in terms of identifying problem, again, interdisciplinary approach was used by engaging with the major stakeholders, the patients through a focus group discussion, through meetings with head of departments and clinicians and clinic staff, as well as a quantitative uh, cross-sectional study to look at the baseline of what is the extent of unwashed needs at 10 selected healthcare clinics. So some of the factors that contribute to unwashed needs include forgetting the issue, the perceived doctor's healthcare provider's attitude, patient's hesitancy because they feel embarrassed, uh, they expect the doctors to actually ask them what are their concerns and the doctors who actually did not have the time or chance to, to ask what were the concerns as well. So, so that, that sets the first phase of coming up with the identifying the problem. So once they are identified the problem, the next step is to use that knowledge to how to and come up with the intervention package. So again, what they did, they sat down with the stakeholders and they come up with a few intervention packages to help to, to improve the issue of unvoiced needs in local context. So a few intervention components were created which, con uh, which uh, affects uh, the patients as well as the healthcare providers. First is what is known as the forgot to ask sleep. This is a patient self-completion agenda form. So what it does, so at the registration counter, the patients were given a piece of paper to write down what are their concerns be even before they see the, the doctor during the consultation. And there are videos and posters to increase the awareness to educate the patients during waiting time. And as for the healthcare providers, there were guidelines and training for healthcare providers on how to address unvoiced needs. And there were additional materials through notebooks and stick-on notes to remind them on addressing the issue of unvoiced needs among patients when they see them during consultations. So that, so that is about the adapting those knowledge to local context. Next. What they did, they rolled out those interventions at five uh, selected healthcare clinics. So it's a quasi-experimental uh, study. So five clinics were chosen for the intervention, another five were used as control. And at the intervention clinics, what they did, they assessed again the usage of, the, of those interventions to see how feasible those interventions are. So they did a fidelity test to see whether the instruments were used as intended. And some issues actually were identified when using those intervention packages. For instance, illiterate patients were unable to fill up the forgot to ask slip and it disrupted the flow of consultations as patients took too long to fill it up and there were some technical issues to be resolved as well. So these were picked up during the fidelity test and they rectified by briefing the staff and trained on giving assistance to fill up again and they serviced the technique, they uh, tackled the technical aspects as well. So as you can see, once they rectify the issue, again, they, 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 they roll out the intervention packages, they monitor the knowledge use and evaluate the outcomes. And it was seen that overall at the intervention clinics, overall unvoiced needs has reduced at multiple centers, especially those with a bas high baseline of unvoiced needs. The, the, those in red are significant uh, reduction from, for instance, center A from 70% to 40%, center D 40 to 30, and so center E from 45 to 8%. Center B and Center C, as you can see, at, even at baseline, there were low level of uh, unvoiced needs. And because of the low uh, sam uh, sample size, then the most likely we could not get the um, significant um, reduction as intended. So overall, you can see that the package, the intervention package was very much useful to tackle the issue of uh, unvoiced needs. So the next step is how to sustain that knowledge use. All right? So this is when knowledge dissemination strategies were done. There were multi-pronged approaches targeting different kind of audience. For the meeting, for, for, for the policy makers, there were meetings and presentations at the MOH National pa Patient Safety, at the Public Health Technical Meeting and Forums and Scientific Meetings. And this is when I come in and I help with the knowledge dissemination by giving promotion, uh, by promoting these intervention packages at hospitals, primary care, at non-MOH facilities as well as well for the scientific community through publications, research highlights, and technical reports. And to sustain the knowledge even further, what they did, they have this what is known as a request tracking form or a track form. From there, they can extract who are their main clients and what kind of requests that they want. Is it what type of knowledge product? Is it the interventions? Is it training? Or is it consultancy? 
From there, they can tailor the intervention package, they can tailor the knowledge products to suit the client's needs. And this can help to sustain uh, KT even further. So that, in a nutshell, is the whole process of KTA from identify problem all the way to sustain knowledge use from translating evidence into practice. So the take home message for this presentation, knowledge translation is definitely essential to translate evidence into practice. The right ingredients are very much needed to be identified as early as possible to facilitate KT process and getting the ingredients and KT action definitely requires interdisciplinary approach. And to me, uh, KT is definitely the best vehicle to connect knowledge creators to the world. And I would like to end with a KT Sanryu. Um, I don't know Japanese, but this is created by a clique of mine. <coughs> I hope I pronounce it correctly. And here it goes. KT wo warera ga thank you mina no tame. Knowledge translation, a quest we all have to do to benefit all. So with that, I thank you.